Yes, good morning, children. Today, we are going to continue the story, uh, the travelogue Silk Road. It's an extract from this uh, travelogue written by Nick Middleton. It's about the journey towards Mount Kedash, which, and in this particular extract, we'll see, uh, we are going to read his journey from, uh, you know, Rabu to Mount Kedash, because it's an extract. We don't have, to, like, we are not reading his complete travelogue only from Rabu to Mount Kedash. So here we come to know that the narrator, the protagonist, Nick Middleton, he leaves Rabu and starts off towards Mount Kedash along with Suzanne and Daniel. Suzanne is a very skilled driver and uh, Daniel is an interpreter. So Suzanne, uh, so uh, they start off the journey and in the beginning we read out like uh, Lamo, Lamo, that woman, you know, she gave him a long sheepskin Coat because she knew that this person, Nick Middleton, would need it later on because the journey would be very, very uh, tedious and it would be very cold region where he would need that kind of thing. And actually it turned out to be very cold for narrator, uh, Nick Middleton, and he would actually uh, really need it, would need it. Okay, anyways, it started. Uh, they went past the mountain passes and they went past various uh, animals like gazelles, wild asses, and even shepherds who were tending she uh, sheep, the flocks of sheep. So they went past many hills and all. So the very first hurdle which they had to face was the road which was blocked with snow. So Daniel and uh, Suzanne, Suzanne had to throw some dirt on that snow ro snowy road to make it a bit better for the car to go on. And uh, later on, uh, when the narrator, uh, when he felt some pressure in his ears, he was able to make out because he had uh, he had that kind of wristwatch that he was able to make out like at what height they were. So by that time, they were at about five to uh, 5,000 somewhere uh, above the sea level. So pressure was building up in his ears. So they keep on going on. And uh, soon, very soon, the roads became more bumpier and the turns became quite sharper and uh, his condition was becoming worse. And meanwhile, we see, we also read out that this Cezanne, you know, he had, uh, uh, he uh, removed the lid from the tank and uh, the petrol hissed. So that was an indication that because of the atmospheric pressure, the petrol was expanding and there was every chance that the engine might get exploded. So somewhere we had read out all these and in between we also read out that they went past the nomadic tents where they came across the mastiffs who used to be the dogs uh, in the imperial courts. So those mastiffs were really very large and ferocious ones and uh, worth mentionable in the story. So by now, so we were here on page number 76. So we have to continue from here. Uh, sorry, not 76, we are on 77 page. So when the roads had be were becoming very uh, steep and all that we had all done, so I checked my watch again as we continued to climb in the bright sunshine. We crept past 5400 zero zero meters and my head began to throb horribly. So the protagonist, Nick Middleton, had severe headache because uh, they were uh, at the height of about 5400 zero, five zero zero meters above sea level. So I took gulps from my water bottle, which is supposed to help a rapid acid. So when you are very at a height like this, then uh, a few drops of water actually helps you out. My finally, we finally reached the top of the pass at five five one five one five meters. So it was marked by a large cairn of rocks, festooned with white silk scarves and ragged prayer, uh, ragged prayer flags. So then they reached uh, uh, this place where, uh, and you people might also be knowing, when we go to any, uh, uh, you know, sacred place or a holy place, there we see uh, that at some places people, you know, put the flags or uh, some ribbons and kinds of things, which show the, uh, which show that that place is actually sacred kinds. So it was a place which was marked by large cairn of rocks where people had, had tied up, you know, white silken scarves uh, with prayer flags. We all took a turn round the cairn in a clockwise direction as is a tradition. So they took a turn, okay, they took a round of the, that place as it was a tradition. 
and Suzanne checked the tires on his vehicle. He stopped at the petrol tank and partially unscrewed the top, which emitted a loud hiss. The lower atmos atmospheric pressure was allowing the fuel to expand. It sounded dangerous to me. Maybe, sir, Suzanne laughed, but no smoking. So Suzanne warned the narrator not to smoke at that place because otherwise it might uh, uh, prove dangerous. So my headache soon cleared as we careened uh, career down the other side of the pass. It was two o'clock by the time we stopped for lunch. We ate hot noodles inside a long canvas tent, part of a work camp erected beside a dry salt lake. So in the, mid, uh, in the afternoon, these people had their lunch and by this time narrator's headache had gone. Uh, then uh, the plateau is pockmarked with salt flats and brackish lakes. Vestiges of the Tits Ocean, which bordered Tibet before the Great Continental Collision, that lifted it skyward. So this one was a hive of activity. Men with pickaxes and shovels trudging back and forth in their long sheepskin coats and salt and crusted boots. All wore sunglasses against the glare as a steady stream of blue trucks emerged from the blindingly white lake laden with piles of salt. So this was only the place where the uh, protagonist was able to see some crowd because here uh, the work was going on. The workers were all there. So by late afternoon, we had reached the small town of Hor. So back on the main east-west highway that followed the old trade route from Lhasa to Kashmir. So by the afternoon, by late afternoon, they reached a very small town uh, in this very place, a very prominent place also Hor. So back on the main east-west highway that followed the old trade route from Lhasa to Kashmir. So it was a place which also connected Lhasa to Kashmir. Daniel, who was returning to Lhasa, found a ride in a truck. So Suzanne and I bade him farewell outside a tire repair shop. So already you people must be remembering in the previous paragraph. Uh, Suzanne, uh, he was worried about the tires of his car, so he wanted them repaired. So they stopped near a tire repair shop and there uh, Daniel went back to Lhasa because uh, he might he might he got some lift from a truck and he went back so now uh, nick middleton who was accompanied by two people one was daniel and one was suzanne so now suzanne is still with him but daniel went back right so we had suffered two punches in quick succession on the drive down from the salt lake and suzanne was eager to have them fixed since they left him with no spares so because the tires had got punctured, so uh, at that salt lake, and he was really very worried about their safety. So he wanted them get fixed and he got them done at a repair shop because he had no spare tires with him. Besides the second tire, he had, cha uh, he had changed, had been replaced by one that was as smooth as my bald head. Okay, Hor was a grim, miserable place. There was no vegetation whatsoever, just dust and rocks. So liberally scattered with years of accumulated refuse, which was unfortunate given that the town sat on the shore of Lake Mansarovar. So this very place Hor was a very miserable place. Why so? Because there was no greenery uh, and uh, on one side there was no greenery, no vegetation. And on the other side, there was a lot of you know dirt and squalor. So they refuse. So there was a, you know, uh, uh, over the years, you know, all those piles of uh, litter and garbage they had gathered over there. And it was really very shocking that uh, the place which was just in, uh, just very near to the Lake Mansarovar. Lake Mansarovar is, uh, you can say, the landmark when you go to the Mount Kadash. So Lake Mansarovar is considered to be one of the most holiest places uh, when you go to Mount Kadash. So some, uh, so the place which is considered to be so holy, just opposite to that place, the, there is you know, so much of garbage dump. So that was very, very unfortunate. Tibet's most venerated stretch of water. So Lake, Lake Mansarovar is what? It's one of the most sacred stretch of water. Ancient Hindu and Buddhist uh, cosmology pinpoints Mansarovar as a source of four great Indian rivers the Indus, the Ganges, the Sapraj, and the Brahmaputra. 
so the uh, this uh, uh, mansarovar is, uh, is you know is the uh, it, it is the source of four great indian rivers which have been written over here the indus the gange the satluj and the brahmaputra actually only the satluj flows from the lake but the head waters of the others all rise nearby on the flanks of mount kailash so we were within striking distance of the great mountain and i was eager to forge ahead so now they were quite near mount kailash and nick middleton was really very anxious to reach there but i had to wait sizan told me to go and drink some tea in horse only cafe which like all the other buildings in town was constructed from badly painted concrete and had three broken windows the good view of the lake through one of them helped to compensate for the drought so hor already was a very very dry place we have already read it out so where this is an wanted to get the car repair and meanwhile he told nick middleton to go and wait for him uh, that he should go to a cafe and have some tea also then uh, he would be able to do his repair work also. so it was the only cafe in the town Uh, which was constructed from badly painted concrete and had three broken windows but from that cafe he could have a full view of the lake right so the view of the lake that compensated for the drought that compensated for the uh, for the kind of uh, you know drought it had the drought because this place was a dry and arid place i was served by a chinese youth in military uniform who spread the grease around on my table with a filthy rag before bringing me a glass and a thermos of tea so so it was a chinese youth who served him uh, tea right uh, and then half an hour later sizan relieved me from my solitary confinement and we drove past a lot more rocks and rubbish westwards out of the town towards mount kailash so half an hour later uh sizan and uh, nick middleton they started towards mount kailash right my experience in hor came as a stark contrast to accounts i had read of earlier travelers <clears throat> so the kind of experience nick middleton had in hor was was exactly the opposite to what he had read in the travelogues so the uh, otherwise he might have read so what uh, what might have been the contrast his experience in or we have seen it was not really very good one he was not very happy with the kind of uh, atmosphere or the kind of environment or the kind of you know paraphernalia in that place but so obviously we are able to make out like he might have read something very good about this place so my experience in or came as a stark contrast to accounts i had read of earlier travelers first encounters with the lake mansarovar Uh, Ikai Gawa Choki, a Japanese monk who had arrived there in nineties, nineteen hundreds, was so moved by the sanctity of the lake that he burst into tears. So there was one traveler, a Japanese monk who had uh, visited this place in about nineteen hundred. He was so touched by the sanctity, the sacredness, the holiness of this place that he almost was in tears when he came here in nineteen hundreds. A couple of years later. the hallowed waters had a similar effect on uh, swen hedden a sweet who wasn't prone to sentimental outburst so the similar kind of experience was of uh, another swedish uh, another sweet the one who wasn't uh, prone to sentimental outburst even he had the similar kind of experience when he visited this place so even the uh, a japanese monk a sweet so all these people you know they were greatly moved by the sanctity of this mansarovar uh, of this place maybe for but narrator uh, he was like quite shocked to see like how could this place be so dry so horrible so miserable so what could be the reason thanks to the tourism uh, tourists the people those who go there so what we the human beings do to a place which actually is uh, is you can say a gift of divinity a gift of god for the mankind to relish the holiness or or the sanctity so 
Yes. So my his experience came as a stark contrast to the accounts he had read of earlier travellers. So which travellers have been mentioned here? Two travellers we have talked about here. One is Ikai Kawachuki, a Japanese monk, and the second one is a Swede. So these two travellers had very good experience of this place, and they talked about it in their books. From there only the narrative could make out like this was a very beautiful place. But actually, when he came here, he found it very miserable. Got it? So it was dark by the time we finally left again. And after 10.30 p.m., we, draw up, we drew up outside a guest house in Darchan, who what turned out to be another troubled night. So finally, they, uh, it was dark by the time we finally left again. And after 10.30 p.m., we drew to outside a guest house in Darchan. So at night, at about 10.30 p.m., the narrator, Nick Middleton, along with Daniel, they, along with, sorry, Suzanne, they reached Darchan. And there they stayed at a guest house. And uh, when they put up in that guest house in Darchan, there Nick Middleton had a very horrible night. So why was it so? Because of his poor health. Let's see. Kicking around in the open air, rubbish dump that passed for the town of Hor had set off my cold once more. So already when uh, they were coming to uh, coming, when they were uh, passing those hills and passes and all. Uh, narrator's Nick Middleton's condition was already not very good, right? So he already had some congestion and headache and all, but by the time they had tea and all, he was okay. But after he had been able to go through those uh, that uh, uh, lake salt, uh, those uh, those of uh, uh, you know heaps of garbage and all, finally his condition became very horrible, and uh, uh, and so now he had his severe cold again. Though if truth be told, it had never quite disappeared with my herbal tea. So it had never disappeared with my herbal tea. So earlier uh, he was saying that he was a little better. His headache had gone, but cold had not gone altogether even with herbal tea. So one of my nostrils was blocked again and, I, and as I lay down to sleep, I wasn't convinced that the other would provide me with sufficient oxygen. So his one nostril was totally blocked. So when he lay, then he found that uh, the one nostril was not enough to provide him with all oxygen. So my, uh, so my watch told me that uh, I was at 4760 meters above sea level. It wasn't much higher than Rabu, and there I had been gasping for oxygen several times every night. So I had uh, grown accustomed to these nocturnal disturbances by now, but this still scared me. So now the height at which this uh, person was now, it was only 476 meters above sea level. And it was exactly the same as it was of Rabu. And by this time, Nick Middleton had become used to uh, these night disturbances, disturbances because of uh, uh, his ability to, this ability to breathe in proper oxygen. But yet he was quite scared of, uh, of any eventuality. Tired and hungry, I started breathing through my mouth. After a while, I switched to single nostril power, which seemed to be admitting enough oxygen. But just as I was drifting off, I woke up abruptly. So though he, uh, in the beginning, the narrator with Nick Middleton, he tried to breathe in uh, through his mouth. And uh, his one nostril was totally blocked. And he was able to breathe in with his one nostril only. Uh, but the moment he would have, uh, he would fall asleep, then uh, he would wake up abruptly, uh, something was wrong. So because he was not able to sleep, so obviously what was wrong that he was not able to breathe in properly, his lungs were not working to the full capacity. My chest felt strangely heavy and I sat up. A movement that cleared my nasal passages almost instantly and relieved the feeling in my chest. Curious, I thought. So his, uh, he felt uh, heaviness in his chest. So he cleared his nasal passages, but uh, that gave him a little bit of relief. But uh, I lay back down and tried again. So again, he tried to sleep, but same result. I was on the point of disappearing into the land of Nod when something told me not to. So then he felt like uh, having a little snap. He felt like having a little sleep. 
but uh, his uh, voice of conscience told him not to sleep because he was scared that maybe while sleeping he would go so it it must have been those emergency electrical impulses again but this was not the same as on previous occasions this time i wasn't gasping for breath i was simply not allowed to go to sleep right sitting up once more immediately made me feel better so whenever he would sit back he would feel better so i could breathe freely and my chest felt fine but as soon as i lay down my sinuses filled and my chest was hot i tried propping myself upright against the wall but now i couldn't manage to relax enough to drop off i couldn't put my finger on the reason but i was afraid to go to sleep a little voice inside me was saying that if i did i might never wake up again so i stayed awake all night so remember children this horrible experience he had at darchan okay so susan took me to darchan medical college the following morning the medical college at darchan was new and looked like a monastery from the outside with a very few very solid door that led into dark courtyard so next day of course susan took him to the medical college of darchan so it was a new and looked like a monastery from the outside with a lock with a very solid door that led into dark courtyard we found the consulting room which was dark and cold and occupied by a tibetan doctor who wore none of the paraphernalia that i had been expecting so when the uh, when nick middleton met that uh, tibetan doctor he was expecting that he would be wearing uh, a long coat like that of a doctor but the doctor was had nothing like that of a doctor so he didn't he was not carrying the kinds of things a doctor should have so he wore none of the paraphernalia that i had been expecting no white coat he looked like any other tibetan with a thick pullover and a woolly hat when i explained my sleepless symptoms and my sudden aversion to lie down he shot me a few questions while feeling the veins in my wrist when the narrator told him everything about his condition about like how he was not able to sleep at all at night he asked him a few questions and uh, felt his pulse it's cold he said finally through sizan so through sizan because we know that sizan uh, uh, might also have been able to interpret so sizan uh, through sizan he communicated to narrator that it was cold so a cold at the effects of altitude i'll give you something for it i asked him if he thought i would recover enough to be able to do the kora oh yes he said you'll be fine so nick middleton was very very uh, apprehensive about the fact like maybe if he would be able to do the kora or not kora is is like taking a round of the place okay so nick middleton the one who had come to this mount kailash from such far of place there by uh, you know undergoing so many bad experiences his purpose was just one that is that to do kora round mount kailash so now he got apprehensive if he would be able to do that or not because of his bad uh, condition but doctor assured him that he would be i walked out of the medical college clutching a few uh, envelopes stuffed with 15 strings of paper so he was given medicine uh, uh, you know he was given 15 packets okay how what kind of packets the small packets uh, wrapped up in paper okay so he got 15 screws of paper i had a five day course of tibetan medicine which i started right away i opened an after breakfast package and found it contained a brown powder that i had to take with hot water it tasted just like cinnamon the contents of the lunch time uh, and bed time packages were less obviously identified identifiable both contained small spherical brown pellets they looked suspiciously like sheep dung but of course i took them that night after my first day's course i slept very soundly like a log not a dead man so the first day course he took okay the description is also there like what kind of medicines were there one uh, pellet looked one uh, one packet looked like a uh, Uh, cinnamon powder and the other two pellets you know they looked a bit like uh, as if they were the sheep skin uh, as if they were uh, the sheep dung but the narrator took it because uh, he he needed to get well 
and because of the dose proper dose of the first day he was able to have a good sleep on that particular night right once he saw that i was going to live sizan left me so once he saw that i was going to live so when sizan was sure that now narrator was all right then he also left to return to lhasa so sizan also left he also returned to lhasa the place from where he had come as a buddhist he told me he knew that it didn't really matter if i passed away but he thought it would be bad for business so as a buddhist uh, sizan told narrator that uh, um, if uh, nick middleton would die then doesn't matter because uh, being a buddhist uh, uh, you know the people those who are very spiritual those who believe in spirituality they don't really mind uh, birth or death okay for them the things are these things are just obvious if somebody is born then what will it die so acceptance comes if you are a spiritual person so sizan told him like it doesn't matter if you die then i don't really mind but the thing is that if you will die then it would be bad for my business so as a driver i am accountable for your good life what it because as a driver he need he would need to bring more tourists to this place so this is his source of livelihood so if his one uh, client would die like this then it would bring him bad name so he said like uh, for his business uh, it was better that uh, nick middleton should survive darshan didn't look so horrible after a good night's sleep so when the narrator was able to have that good sleep at night you know then he didn't find darshan a horrible place right now darshan looked a bit better so it was still dusty partially derelict and punctuated by heaps of rubble and refuse but the sun shone brilliantly in a clear blue sky and the outlook across the plain to the south gave me a vision of the himalayas commanded by a huge snow capped mountains so gurla manhatta with just a wisp of cloud suspended over its summit okay we'll be explaining all these tomorrow so from page number 80 and 81 we'll do tomorrow and uh, yes let me meanwhile check your attendance